Okay, before going to start the proper session, let me introduce our guest speaker, Dr. Muhammad Farhadinia. Since the age of 16, he has been involved in the wild cat conservation. He started as a volunteer compiling a data set of observation on the Asiatic cheetah at Tehran Zoo in 1997. In 2001, he co-founded the Iran Cheetah Society, an NGO dedicated to the conservation of cheetah and other wild carnivores. In 2008, he was assigned as the deputy manager of the conservation of the Asiatic Cheetah program, all while completing his master's thesis on the endangered Persian leopards. After winning the Future for the Nature Award in 2009, Muhammad finished his MPhil at the University of Oxford in 2018 and established the Future for Leopard Foundation. Up till now, he authored more than 150 peer-reviewed publications his research focuses on analytical methods to improve understanding of the wider factors affecting biodiversity conservation in West and Central Asia, considering environmental resources and cross-border conservation, with the goal of leveraging biodiversity conservation in the region of the world. So we are welcome and we are honored to have you here, sir. The stage is over to you, sir. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone in, in Pakistan. And it's a great pleasure for me to yeah, giving this talk to you on this day. And it has been always a pleasure for me to meet uh, uh, friends and, you know, our neighbor as I am from Iran. So great to speak to you. So uh, today I will be discussing about ecology and behavior of leopards and other large carnivores in mountainous regions of Northeastern Iran. So I thought that this idea, this, this topic might be interesting for you as perhaps you have, we shared similar issues and concerns and problems in conservation for big cats and large carnivores in, in Iran and Pakistan and perhaps all those countries. So uh, I'm trying to, oh yeah. So, I, so, so before going into carnivores, I will start my talk with, uh, uh, with the name, Alexander von Humboldt. And he is, he was, he was a Prussian naturalist, or as we call it today, a German naturalist, explorer and geographer 350 years ago. And he was very keen about mountains. So he started to travel to many mountainous regions of the world, mostly in Latin America, to try to understand the patterns and similarities across the mountains in the world. So this is a sketch of an illustration he drew uh, two, 220 years ago. And he tried to find, find what are the similarities and differences at different levels of height and temperatures between mountains in different parts of the world. So for example, this one, I guess it should be for somewhere in Ecuador or Chile in Latin America. And he tried to find the, uh, the, the pattern of species occurrence across the gradient of height. So that's what he was one of the first guys who realized that mountains are important. And as we both know, yeah, our countries are hugely mountainous, are, are providing lots of ecosystem services to people like water, agriculture, uh, crops, uh, hydropower production facilities. So the, we, we are receiving too much from the mountains. But the amount of knowledge we have about the animals which live in those rugged landscapes, in mountainous landscapes, is not too much. And I am here to discuss about two species. So the first one is on the left, the Persian leopard, the cats. And on the right, we have the... the so these are two, two carnivores, which I guess I'm, I'm sure you have also in Pakistan. And they have large spatial requirements. They need large areas to live because they need to travel too much long distances and to, to find food. And both of them are obligate predators. They need to kill to, to live. They need to kill something. But the question is, we and with these animals, which need lots of areas to live and lots of food, how they can cope with mountains which are increasingly crowded by too many people because of the water, because of the agriculture. So how we can we should be able to save them. So I will be starting, I, I will be covering six topics in this talk. So the first one is about the population ecology, simply how many leopards we have in one, in one area. The second one is about the spatial, spatial ecology, how they move in the landscape, how they share their resources with each other. 
Then we go to understand about, okay, we know how many leopards are there, we know how they move, but the question is how they interact within an area, how they interact within, with each other. So interspecific interaction. And then we finish the leopard story with decision-making. How do you decide in the landscape to move, when they move, when they start to not to move? So this deciding between these options is important for us to understand their behavior. And finally, we engage with wolves and other top predators in those landscapes and try to understand the human dimension, how these wolves and leopards are living with people. Uh, eventually, we need to manage the land. So how land use management affects the conservation of these animals, especially in areas which is similarly, simply everywhere, uh, that we have too many people and agriculture and herding pastures, everything. So the study area is in Kopedak Transboundary Ecoregion. So it's part of an, it's part of Iran, but it's shared between Iran and Turkmenistan. So not far, not far from Pakistan. So we have Afghanistan and a tiny portion of this ecoregion, Kopedak, it covers uh, western, uh, western, uh, yeah, Afghanistan. So it's not far from Pakistan, but yeah, it covers Afghan, uh, Afghanistan as well. So between Iran and Turkmenistan, you can see that there are about 600 kilometers of border along, uh, uh, along this ecoregion. So it's a, it's a huge ecoregion with lots of similarities and shared resources between Iran and, uh, and uh, yeah, Turkmenistan. So this is uh, one of the study areas we worked in. And it was called uh, Tandura National Park. So Tandura is the name of a spring in those mountains. And because of that the spring, they have called the whole area as Tandura National Park, which has been under protection for the last 50 years. And we, the leopards are mostly living inside the national park. But at the same time, we have wolves outside of the national park, rarely coming into the national park. And outside of the national parks, you can see all those red signs, which each one represent a village or human settlement. And wolves are mostly among those people. Not surprising, I'm sure you have seen the same in Pakistan. And leopards are mostly away from people, not going many, most, uh, most of the time to the, to the villages. And at the end, you can see a, a yellow line, which is the border between Iran and Turkmenistan. So Tandura National Park is, is just at the border. It's a border national park. So we started work, this work, by uh, using the camera traps. So in this area, which is just 350 square kilometer, and, uh, and we know that many mountainous national parks are not very big. They are small and tiny, tiny national parks. We, uh, we deployed 80 camera traps. So camera traps for, I think most of you are, are familiar, but for those of you which might not be familiar, it's just a camera which we put it in the field and the battery uh, helps to run for 60, 70 days. And then when anything passing by would be photographed and then we can compare the photos and understand how many of each individual of the leopard or perhaps in your case, snow leopards have been, how many individuals have been photographed. So you can see here the camera traps spread across the national park and the, 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 uh, the, the blue ones are actually water resources because we put in, in summer. So in summer, we use, the, we use the, uh, uh, the benefit of having the camera traps at the water resources because animals need water. So they come to the water. And you can see here a number of photos we were able to, to, to take at these water resources. And many of them are, uh, yeah, I think yeah, all of them are just at the water. And we could, uh, we could take a photo of a family of four on the top left. And then at the top uh, bottom left, you can see a leopard approaching and the chukar partridges, they were just flying away. And then, yeah, many more. So you, uh, based on this photo, you, these photos give you a glimpse of how rugged and mountainous is this national park. So we are discussing about deep valleys and uh, steep valleys, yeah. So it was surprising to see that in Tandura National Park, which you can see on this map, not far from the border in Turkmenistan, when we use a spatial capture recapture models or S SCR, we found some of the highest densities of the leopards in Asia. So we found a density of six, 
almost six individuals per 100 adult individuals per 100 square kilometer. So just to give you an example of how high is that, except India and perhaps part of Sri Lanka, everywhere in Asia is really, the density of leopards really exceeds two per 100 square kilometer. But here we had six, so almost three. Three, three times more than the average for the entire Asian continent. So it's a high density of the leopards, which is amazing. And it's not six, we repeated the same survey in other national parks, and we found four individual per 100 square kilometer in another national park, and even in another one up to eight. So even higher densities were found around, along those uh, mountainous landscapes. That was an amazing report. That was an amazing finding. We had no idea that these mountainous national parks, even small ones, can hold such a high density of the leopards. And the question was that, can we really expect such a high density of leopards in small mountainous areas surrounded by too many people, livestock herders, pastures, croplands, agriculture, roads, everything? So how is that possible? So I should tell you an interesting story. The number, maybe some of you are, uh, are able to read in Farsi as uh, I, I guess we have some similarities in words or in, in, the, in pronunciation. So here, the number of leopards, which, was, uh, with, uh, which uh, we found using the camera traps appeared on the front page of one of the, uh, one of the newspapers. And it was that 35 leopards were detected in Tandura National Park, 35 in one single area. And then it went viral that, wow, we have such a large density and such large population of leopards. But there was a problem because nobody believed me. And then I was accused that, well, I have been faking the numbers. The numbers have been made up because how on earth is possible to have such a high density of leopards in one tiny small national park? it's not possible. Maybe we have not been able to detect the photos properly or we have made up or whatever. But on the scientific aspect, the question was, is still valid? Is that possible? For the leopard movement, because they are sending the GPS data to the satellite on, to our desktop or the cell phone. And we were able to find where is the leopards now. And then we realized that we use the autocorrelated kernel density estimation method. And that enabled us to understand the home range size for these leopards. So you can see here that each one has a home range. So each home range is composed of two parts. The yellow part is the core area where the leopard is most spending most of the time. And then you have the buffer zone or the, the big one, the, the brown one, which is actually the, the actual home range. But less time of the leopard is spend, spent in those brown areas. Well, we realized that the home range for each leopard was an average 100 square kilometer. And that added, and that re really did not help us to resolve the problem, to resolve the question, because in an area which is 350 square kilometer, if we have a home range of just 100 square kilometer, so we, we, we can't have too many leopards because the leopards cannot overlap everything. They need everyone, he, they are territorial animal. So in that way, we should say, well, we might have only four or five leopards, not 35. How 35 is justifi justifiable? Well, this is the moment that we didn't stop. So if we, did, if we, stop at the, if we had to stop at this, mom, at this moment, we were not able to answer the, the main question. And we did more analysis. So well, we realized that although the main or the, the, the leopards are occupying large home ranges, which is 100 square kilometer, but the core area, the place that most of their activities is specified and con, con, uh, constrained to, is just a tiny portion of that huge area. It's just three, 30 square kilometer, about 30%. So the leopards are living in huge areas but most of their time is just spent within 30% of that huge area. So, well, in that way, we should say, well, okay, that's, that makes sense because if they are spent, they are mostly active in one tiny portion area. So we, should, we could say that, well, we can have too many leopards. And then we realize that the neighboring leopards, they show high overlap between each other. 
And we realized that about 40% of the home range is shared between the neighbors. So although the leopards are territorial, but somehow they tolerate each other. They share the part of the home range with the other ones. But the question is, which part of the home range is shared? Well, at the same time that we were monitoring the leopards, we were able to understand what animals they are killing. And I guess you have all these animals in Pakistan. Down from the top, you have the Ural, which I think you have them. And then we have the Bezoa goat and the wild pig, which seems to be everywhere. And then on the bottom, you have the, wild, uh, the domestic sheep and domestic dog. So five main prey. But what we realized, was that 90% of all those kills are made within the core area. So basically, what does that mean? Is that the leopards have a small core area, which 90% of their kills are made within. And those are actually their hunting area. They do not share the hunting area with the neighbors. What they share is outside of the core area. And in that way, they have an exclusive hunting area but they have moderate overlap with neighbors. So they are at the same time that are protecting their food from the neighbors, but they allow the neighbors to come not to, to share within their home range, uh, the, the, the buffer of the home range. So that's one solution to the to, to, to response to the, the, that question. Is that possible to have such a high density of leopards? Yes, by having a small core area, not sharing, but sharing the outside with the neighbors even though we can have such a large uh, home bridge for the leopards. So the next question was that, well, okay, we know that we have too many leopards and they should have some sort of interaction. So these territorial animals, we know from African studies that they are killing each other. They are avoiding each other. They do infanticide and infanticide means that males kill cubs in order to make sure that the female comes back to the estrus and they, they can mate again to have their own cubs. So all these actions are running in the leopard population. But the question was that, well, if we have such a high density of the leopards, how would be the interaction between leopards in this area? So to understand that one, we said two sets of hypotheses. But the first one was that between the leopard, the male ones, which you can see the photo in the middle, and the lone females, which you can see on the bottom left. So are, is there any overlap or avoidance between adult males and females? And based on the studies published in Africa, we hypothesize that there should be some temporal intersexual segregation, which means, which simply means that females, females and males are active during different times of the day, not to overlap. But at the same time, what was more interesting is between males and families. So on the left one, we have females without the cops. On the, le on the right hand, we had families. When we have females, they are accompanied by cops. So the hypothesis was that mostly around the infanticide. So we knew that leopards are killing the, the, the cops. So in that way, we expected that females would avoid the males in order to save their, their, their cops. So based on these two studies, we went to analyze their, 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 our data, the camera trap data using multi-species occupancy modeling. And the student I supervised in, in his master, in her master, she realized that there is a positive pairwise co-occurrence between males and females, which, which, seem, which means that Males and females are the same place. Uh, they, are, they, are, they are here in the same place. When we found exactly the same between males and families, they also showed positive pairwise co-occurrence, co which again means that they are co occur in the same place. So well, they are not separating their place. But how about the time? The niche has two, a number of aspects, and one is a space, one is time. So we, we know that the space is not separated. How about time? So she worked more on these uh, time curves, uh, temporal curves using non-parametric kernel density estimation, which has been developed about more than a decade ago. And what she realized was that the females with cubs, they do not avoid 
temporally or actually in terms of the time from the adults. So which means that the families are not avoiding the males, spatially nor uh, temporally. So back to the hypothesis, we realize that the temporal segregation ha is happening between adult males and adult females based on the previous studies. We found exactly the same. We did not find any spatiotemporal inter segregation between the families and males, which was against what we, what we initially hypothesized. So one hypothesis was approved, the other one was rejected. That's how science works. Not every time everything would be approved. But the question was that, well, if we have too many leopards, so how is that possible that these females with cubs, they need to protect their cubs? So why they are not avoiding adult males? Why they are careless about their cubs? In that way, we should see too many cubs to be killed. We found two explanations to explain why that is, there is no avoidance. There was no evidence for avoidance between the males and, and cubs. The first one, what is what's called paternity confusion hypothesis. So what does that mean? It means that when you have multiple males in one single area, the female tries to mate with all of them, right? tries to uh, copulate with all of them. So in that way, there is, there is uh, the males are not able to understand who is siring those offsprings. So the cubs could be, it could belong to this male, the male one or the male two or to all, to all of them. So in that way, the female tries to confuse males with the notion that we don't know who is the, who is the father, so not, do not kill your cubs because they can be your cubs. So in that way, they are protecting. So the evidence for that was that in all the camera traps stations that we found the cubs, we realized that there are at least uh, two or three males occurring in, uh, in that area. So, which, which means that all of them can sire those cops. So that's the first explanation, which what to, to further approve this, this hypothesis, we need to do genetic work, which we didn't do that. So that's just the initial hypothesis. But it's not only about how these animals interact with each other. Mountains, as we started our work with Alexander von Humboldt, the mountains and the amazing uh, features of this landscape heterogeneity that they provide to us, that might be another solution that these animals are able to coexist without having too many aggressive interaction with, with, with each other. So the second explanation was landscape heterogeneity, or actually how these mountains are providing too many refuges, refugees and, you know, uh, covered for the leopards to hide from each other or be active while the other one is not seeing this one. But how does that mean? Landscape heterogeneity. This is one of the base camps. You can see my tent just down there on that ridge line. And on that ridge line, we had to spend 20 nights in one of the expedition and missions we had to go to wait for the leopards to show up in one of the traps. And the traps were basically snare traps that we had to wait for the leopard to put its paw inside the trap. And then the snare was triggered and activated and the leopard was stuck. So we had to go and anesthetize the leopard to put the color on. But waiting for 20 nights in this tent without having tea and no bathroom and no shower and no proper drinking water and no cell phone coverage, was not easy. And that made me to think about too many things. So one of them was about this one. As we are naturalists, so we, had the, we have the passion to see the animals and think about, well, okay, these are beautiful, but how does behave, these animals behave in the landscape? Especially when you, have, when you have 20 days in just living in those areas, in those areas without having access to any human or whatsoever. So every day in the morning, early morning, I. I, my, 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 uh, my habit was to uh, just wake up, uh, pray and having salah and then uh, sitting in front of the tent. And in front of the tent, you seeing the music, my binocular, the, the front slope. And on the front slope, there was a small herd of this bezoar gold or actually ibex, which appeared to 
from this, those ridge lines from the, from, from the opposite of the tent. And they appeared from the ridge line and coming all the way, grazing down, all the way down to the valley below us. And there was a spring below us, so which we had to share between ourselves and those animals. And then going down all the way and then grazing, drinking water and coming, climbing back up to the ridge line and then disappear. So the, all this way took about three, four hours from those animals. And I was thinking, well, if I had a color on any of those animals, what was able to see from the satellite? And we know from the satellite that it is only on X and Y axis. So because the satellite see everything on a flat surface, so it gives you a coordinate on a GPS, which is X and Y axis. The question was that if I had the data from those Bezra goat, what I was able to see was that they had some tiny portion, tiny, tiny mov movement around one location, which seems to be not very energetically demanding. But in reality, I had seen that these animals were spending lots of, lots, lots of time, a couple of hours, climbing down, grazing, climbing up, and they have been active for the whole morning, three, four hours, not sitting somewhere, just moving around. In fact, because we are not able to understand the third dimension, which is the, which is the Z axis in those uh, mountainous landscapes, we simply, we simplify the movement, we simplify the, the complexity and complication of the movement in those landscapes. Because we, th we, we, we think that they are just moving on an X and Y axis, like if they are, these animals are living in, in open plains. So those deep valleys, and I am sure that you have many of those deep valleys in Pakistan as well, are actually one thing that we need to understand and incorporate in, in, in our modeling, which we did. So what we did was that we used four leopards with color. And these four leopards were adult mates, which were uh, with adult mates, which were uh, actually uh, colored at the same time. So they had to be, so what, what we realized was that we found that these four leopards, which are actually neighboring, they have their own territory, they have their own home range. What we, what we realized was that each one of them is killing prey on a different altitude. So you can see on the right, the, the right leopard was killing, the, the, killing the, the prey on the highest altitude. The, left, the middle one is killing on the lowest altitude and you have two more on the, on the medium altitude. In fact, the altitude in which the leopard were killing was about, sorry. Go back to there. Yeah, it was about 200 meters higher or lower than the neighbor, which is pretty interesting. We had no idea that these leopards are not only specified and con uh, constrained to one single area, which we call it home range, but it's on X and Y axis. But it is also important to see the, the, the depth of the valleys, the, the other, you know, the, the landscape heterogeneity across the landscape. So that was interesting. Well, okay, so these animals are not only separating their home range, they're also the separating the, the altitude as well. And it can be 200 meters and 200 meters is huge in the mountains. It, 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 it changes the temperature, it changes the rainfall, it changes the snow, snow depth, everything. So these ones should need their own uh, adaptation to cope with this situation. Well, okay, so this is, this is the mountain I did my, my PhD. It's a beautiful mountain. But it's not only about how they change or actually separate their, their, their home range. Considering the third dimension or actually the, the Z axis is important because if we focus on planimetric home range estimation, it underestimates its spatial requirements. So, so planimetric means that just two axes, one and uh, X and Y or actually two, uh, uh, two dimensional. If we forget to consider the third dimension, which calls the, the, the topographic uh, home range, it's, it's underestimates. So here we can see that up to 35%, if we do not consider the third dimension, we will see the underestimation in the home range. So which basically means that 
we are we think that the leopards are confined to this area they need a smaller area while they need much larger area and it's important because we need to share those lands with people with agriculture and everything so understanding these things is, is important Then we worked on them, and we know that them are them are digital elevation models in, in, in GIS. So we split the leopards in two, two groups, and three of them were residents. So residents are individuals which are somehow confined to one area, which we call it home range. They rarely go beyond that. So they are mostly adult ones, which have already established their, their, uh, their, their, uh, their home range. At the same time, we have non-residents, which or which or what we call non-transient. So these non uh, these non-residents are basically mostly young ones or old ones, which have no home range and they have to patrol around to see where is the vacant position, vacant location, just to pop in and occupy that area at the home range. So each plot here represents one single individual, one single leopard. So the top one, top three are the resident ones, those who have a home range. The lower one, they are the ones without a, a home range or non-resident ones. So you can see the color variation. So these color variation represent the variation in the altitude each leopard is living. So the resident ones are mostly on the, on, on the red and orange color, which means that they are just specified to, to higher elevations. In contrast, you can see for the non-residents, lots of uh, blue colors. So blue colors mostly represent lower elevation, lower altitudes. So it, it means that non-residents, they need to patrol from high to low altitudes to find somewhere. They need to go everywhere. So in that way, what we can see is that they are more prone to kill livestock. So, if we consider five main prey for the leopards, which from the right, we can see the Bezura goat. Then we have the Uriel sheep, which you have them in Pakistan, the wild pig, domestic sheep, and the domestic goat. The place where Bezura goats and Uriel sheep are killed are, are, are about 1,500 uh, 1, meters above the sea level. In contrast, for the wild pigs and sheep and domestic goat, domestic dog, domestic dog is about 1,000 meter, about 1,100. So in fact, they, when the leopards want to kill something which is wild prey, they are on average 400 meters above when the time they want to kill something domestic. Although we know that the wild pig is not domestic, they, they, are, they are just everywhere, but mostly around the farm. So what is important is that we usually go for when we want to put the people and conservation in one place, we mostly focus on X and Y axis. Okay, this area is for us, this area is for people, this area is for snow leopards, for brown birds, for leopards or whatever, and this is for humans. It's we try to zone them, we try to put in different zones. While it's not only to put the, it's not important to do the zonation, it's also important to consider the, the altitude as well. You can, we can have the same, in the same communities, but across different, different altitudes. So understanding the altitudes is, is crucial. And finally, for the leopard section, we will be discussing on the fourth top topic. And this topic is about decision-making in mountains. So the, when you have the leopards with colors, they may, should make a decision. They should make a decision when to sit, when to kill, when to sleep, when to move, when to go from, among people, when to not to go among people. So these are all important questions which are important, interesting at the same time from the biological and ecological perspective too. So you can see here based on the, this, the one of the leopards which was colored, the leopard starts to kill a, a, a sheep in, down the, the photo. And the sheep took the leopard time for about a week. So all those red, and green dots show that the leopard had just tiny movement, small move, small, uh, small uh, movement. And then when the sheep was finished, it starts to patrol on those uh, blue long distances, long, you know, long strides. And then go, going back to another area and then killing a bezoar goat after 10 days. 
And then when the Bezroy goat was killed, the animal again stayed, uh, had less mobility, staying somewhere just to eat the goat and then moving away. So you can see how these movements are, are affecting. But it's important to, it's important to uh, understand the decision-making on a population level. So we try to understand, well, each individual has three main states. State one means that when these animals are not moving a lot, they are just sleeping somewhere under a tree or just feeding on something. So they are sleeping somewhere. State three, state three are the green ones, means that when these animals are moving, just, just moving and walking and walking. And state two is, is somewhere in between. They just sleep somewhere, move for a, for a bit and then sleep away. So it's just a, it's an intermediate situation. So they have three states when you analyze the data using the colors. But when you can understand how these movements are affected by the temperature of the day, uh, time of the day, if they are more active in, in the early morning, in late evening, the temperature, how does that affect? And one thing which is important is hunger level. Hunger level means that if they are full or not full. And how we understand if the animal was full or not was based on the data we found using the kills. So we were able to understand where the animal and when the animal killed something based on the color data. Yeah, so, so I just focus on this hunger. And then again, with this hunger, we use hidden Markovian models. And you can see on the left, we have the resident leopards, the leopards which have a home range. And on the right, you have non-residents, the leopards which, do, which don't have a home range, they just patrol around to see where is vacant, just to pop in and occupy as a home range. And you can see here that for the hunger, the animals which are less, which are resident, when they, no matter how, how, now how full they were, they had to move, they had to move, they had to move every time because they need to make sure that nobody is coming into their home range. But when you have the non-resident ones, when you, the hunger level is low, the animals just stay there, they don't move a lot. And when the hunger level goes up, they start to patrol around, perhaps to find something to kill which means that because they don't have a home range, they don't need to move a lot. The only time they need to move is just to find something, which means that when they are hungry. But for the resident ones, no matter how full or hunger, how hungry they are, they need to move because it's not only to find food, it's to, find, it's to make sure that the, the neighborings are not intruding into the home range. Which means that being a resident leopard, is energetically, energetically costly behavior because you need to protect the home range. You need to protect your food. You need to protect your mate, your cubs, and the, above all, the home range. So it's in that way, uh, they have to move a lot. And But at the same time, if you are non-resident, just have a meal, stay there for a week, then move away and then find another meal because you don't need to protect anywhere because you don't have any land. So you do, it's much less energetically costly. Well, we finished the leopard part. We started the population ecology. We realized that there was a huge population there with massive spatial requirement, and they had they show amazing interaction between each other, between males and females, or between males and cops, and how this decision making is is working with this leopard population. But for the last slides of my talk, I will be covering something about the wolves, and it's about mostly about human dimension and how we need to understand the land use management. So this is the national park, the Tandura National Park that we worked in. And in this national park, we had these, the wolves are out mostly outside of the national park. The leopards are mostly inside the national park. So inside the national park, no villages. Outside, you can see those red signs as village. So how these two are affecting people attitude toward these carnivores? So we used uh, questionnaire surveys and camera trap data. And you can see here how these animals are moving and working in the landscape. Leopards are rarely going outside the national, national park sometimes. And at the same time, wolves rarely coming into the national park. They are mostly outside, perhaps for the sheep and goats and domestic animals. So this is how these two are living there. 
<laughs> so what we realized based on the question questionnaire was that each leopard is killing on average about one sheep per year from each household. So it's not too many. We can see that, okay, it's just one sheep. It's not, and each herd is about 300, 200. So one sheep is not too many. So the leopards are not committing too much damage to the people. At the same time, wolves are killing about five or six times the leopards, about five sheep per year from each household. Well, the, lep the, the wolves are, they are a bit more, a bit notier. They are they are causing more damages. But what was interesting was that when we ask people, okay, what do you feel? How is what is your attitude towards it toward this animal? We found something interesting. What we realized was that okay, people have showing different pattern from the left, which is which is strongly like to the right, which is strongly dislike or the most negative views. But what we realize is that people usually have positive views towards the leopards and mostly negative views towards the, the wolf. And I presume it's, it's the same for, for Pakistan as well, perhaps in many, many areas or snow leopards as well. But we realize that people who lose to more sheep and go to the wolves, they tend to dislike leopards as well. So if it means that if you have multiple species in one ecosystem, one species can one species can kill just tiny number, the other one can cause lots of damages. But when we think that okay, this one should be safe, this one is the, the problem, but at the same time we realize that well, it's not like that, because this one, which is causing lots of problems, is affecting the people's mind and attitude towards the other one, which means that because people are losing too many animals and it's about the economy, if you lose too much, too much money to wolves, you would say, well, I don't care about what predator it is. I, I hate them all. I hate the wolf, leopards as well. So we need to consider if we want to protect one endangered species like the leopards, the Persian leopards, we need to consider the wolves, even though that we, we think that they are more abundant and less endangered, because these wolves can affect people's understanding and attitude. But the next question is, okay, we know how this wolf, uh, the, the leopard attacks are affecting the population. But the question is what we can do. And then we used Bayesian occupancy modeling. And we had two, two questions. Uh, we realized that based on this figure, you can see here that there is a line. And on the x-axis, you have the, the distance to the village where people have more chance to lose any animal to the to the wolf, to the leopards. And you can see here at about two kilometers away from the village, the number of kills by the by the leopards increased massively. So it means that people are people are more likely to lose to leopards when they are away from the village. So I know that the situation, for example, in the snow leopard, it's, it's some, in, uh, in some places different in Pakistan because they are mostly causing a problem inside the village when they have the, entered the, the corrals. But in our situation, we have two options. Do we need to establish proper corrals inside the village? Or do we need to have proper dogs and people and shepherds and herder in, in companion with the, with, the, with the sheep and goats out there in the pasture? The data shows that inside the village, having proper corral is not helpful. We need to focus when they are away, having proper dogs and shepherd. That's what can help people. Well, the last part of my talk is about an, a paradigm, which is, uh, I think uh, many, have, many of you have heard, perhaps some of you have heard about this. And it's quite imminent in terms of the, global need for food and agriculture. So the food and agriculture, they need land. And having land means that we need to somehow manage the land in a way that we also have the animals and biodiversity there. So how we can have biodiversity and, uh, and people food at the same place. So this is a paradigm which is called land sharing versus land sparing. So on the left, you can see the land sharing model which means that we both, humans and wildlife, we both occur at the same place. We somehow coexist in the same place. So that's actually the coexisting model. On the right, you can see the land sparing model or land separate, it's called separation model. So what does that mean? We have national parks. Sometimes it could be fenced like in Africa or in North America. 
And then we have the agriculture and farmland and people. So they are separated. They are not coexisting. They are separated. Which one works for our countries? For our countries, which we have growing number of people, we have huge effect of climate change, which have at the same time animals like leopards or snow leopards or birds, which need massive areas to live. So how we can manage all these things? So that's the topic for the last part of the talk. So based on the colors we deployed on the leopards, we realized that, and you can see here these, uh, these, uh, the, the home range of each leopard, which we colored. We realized that each leopard is spending about 83% of its time inside the national park, which is actually the spared land. So inside the national park, which we don't have any people, it's just a spared land separated for, for the wildlife. And but at the same time, about one fifth, or actually 17% more precisely, of their time is spent among people, which is actually on the shared land outside of the national park, just living, just, just moving around among people, trying to find a sheep, to find to kill a dog, and then going back to the national park. So it's on a, on a ratio of four to one, spared land or shared land. So it means that we can't have only an idea of just spare land or share land. We need to have both for our landscapes. We need to have the national parks. We need to have protected areas. They are where the, these animals are spending most of the time. But at the same time, we can't think about the survival and viability of these large carnivores without having thinking about the coexistence among people because they go there. They are not stuck inside the national park. They go there. But it's not only about the leopards. We can see a contrasting response to this land use management. So on the left one, we use the Bayesian occupancy modeling in a paper which is currently under and press on the, in, in biodiversity and conservation, the journal. And you can see that wolves have higher, higher uh, chance of occupancy in shared lands, which means lands which are the, the agricultural lands and much lower chance of occurrence in a spared land or actually inside the national park. And exactly the opposite pattern for the leopards. The leopards are mostly occurring inside the spared lands, while inside the shared land, it's much less common. So what does that mean? So it means that each carnivore is responding to land use management differently. We can't put a paradigm for all the carnivores to make sure that all of them would survive. Each one of them needs its own requirements. One of them is a stick to the shared land, which actually is agricultural land. The other one is a stick to the national park or actually the, the spared lands. So in that way, what we can see is that, well, we need to have a combination of both. We can't just forget about the other one because we can't simply just protect the leopards, the Persian leopard or snow leopards. We need to protect the entire ecosystem because even though that the leopards are not killing the too much livestock, they are affected the, the way how people are framing them is affected by how people, how many sheep are killed by the wolves. So what we re think that is that it's not a, a, a legitimate discussion anymore to think about land sharing versus land sparing model. What we need is a plus sign up there is land sharing and land sparing model. If you want to protect all the landscape at the same time meeting the food, the food requirement of an energetic requirement of people, many of them poor people uh, which are living in, in poverty. So they, we need to make sure that they, have, they also have a, have, a, have, a, have a life as well. So today we discussed about six uh, topics under the framework work of uh, large carnivores and at the same time mountains. And I started my work with Alexander von Hobbes, the guy, the, the scholar who had uh, lots of exploration mountains. And I would like to finish my work with, with this slide from the FAO, the FAO, about the mountains which are important and vital for our lives. And mountains are obviously a big proportion of our countries in Iran and Afghanistan and Pakistan, in Northern India. So many of those countries are, need to think about those mountains in, uh, more and more because many lives are dependent on them. Lots of biodiversity hotspots are dependent on them. About one fourth of the terrestrial biodiversity is occurring those mountains. 
and they, they are a main a main reservoir for water on the on the planet and actually a good refugio for our climate change efforts so i would like to thank you i would like to thank the the Department of Zoology at Lahore University and many colleagues and co-authors and partners and donors which helped us to study all this stuff for the almost the past decade since 2013-12. I had the privilege of working with a number of uh, very good Pakistani scholars as well, Dr. Ali Nawaz, we published a paper the, two years ago on the Belt and Road Initiative and, and Dr. Mohammad Kabir from the uh, uh, yeah, from, from the car carnivore ecology lab, and we are working together on a number of other stuff. So with this uh, slide, I would like to thank you for listening and hope you enjoyed. So I uh, would first of all uh, like to thank uh, Dr. Mohammad Farhadino for his very valuable talk and uh, it has been a wonderful work. It has been uh, so beneficial for all of us and uh, perhaps uh, his studies his analysis and uh, how could he interpret the ecological and uh, 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 and uh, the environmental aspects the, the way he has covered all this this was wonderful and terrific lecture terrific talk uh, doc sub thank you doctor thank you very much doc mohammed uh, on behalf of uh, the Department of Zoology, Government College in Sri Lahore, and uh, on behalf of all the participants. So thank you very much. And uh, Dr. Mohammed, taking this opportunity, I would like to extend uh, an invitation, uh, perhaps at any stage, uh, our uh, we would like to collaborate in studies or in research. So whatever wildlife students, uh, post-grad and undergrad, they are doing in wildlife research in wildlife or some of them might uh, might opt to work with wildlife so i would like to extend my invitation uh, so we can we can uh, collaborate at some level and we can uh, have some uh, we can uh, explore some uh, mutual areas where uh, we can be beneficial so as you know in uh, countries like pakistan or uh, this region, uh, you might well be aware that we are scarce of resources, uh, but uh, we, our students and our faculty, they are usually very enthusiastic. So, uh, Dr. Mohammed, uh, I look forward to have a uh, good partnership and working relationship with you in future. Once again, thank you very much for a very wonderful talk you made our day today. And it was uh, so wonderful to have you here. And uh, I believe any one of us have any queries, any questions, uh, Dr. Mohammed uh, would be uh, happy to respond if we could send uh, him some queries or questions. So, all right. Thank you very much. Yeah. The, the, the pleasure was mine to give a talk to you. Yeah, please go ahead if there is any question. I have a like a sort of comment and uh, sort of question from Dr. Mohammed. Uh, since this uh, fauna we share with him, Iran, Pakistan, Afghanistan, even in India, so this fauna, we we share much of the fauna and leopards, yes, leopard has been, uh, is, uh, has been listed in uh, critically endangered in Pakistan and uh, leopard has been in uh, the, uh, in the Iran region as well. So the, uh, what would you, uh, I mean, in a country like Pakistan, where conservation efforts has been scarce, and even studies uh, have been scarce, and uh, uh, people's perception is uh, uh, also different. Sometimes people think this is an uh, enemy animal. So uh, community participation is one way we can go ahead with this. and. Uh, uh, so, please uh, uh, briefly tell us, uh, do you have a model, if we can go ahead with a model like uh, ecotourism and wildlife conservation and conservation of these predators go side by side? Please. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. 
So I think uh, that Pakistan is all is uh, yeah we we are living in a region with where the resources are scarce and uh, wildlife conservation is obviously not the top priority for the policymakers, but we are trying struggling to save all those animals. But I think Pakistan it has been very uh, a, a, a leading model for using you know community-based trophy hunting to take the areas. There are about 10 countries in Asia which are working on trophy hunting and all of them are using Pakistan as a model. So you have that model which has been, perhaps it's, it's controversial, but it has been working for at least for some areas for to protect perhaps snow leopards or other animals and dogs because of the dogs and, and burials and everything. So that's, that's something that we need to consider more because uh, also that there's this trophy hunting issue is has been uh, running for ages now in iran it has been running for 60 70 years in pakistan the same for, for, for years it has been regulated uh, <clears throat> sometimes in afghanistan as well in kyrgyzstan in tajikistan but i think we have much less data about this trophy hunting and i think with what is important is that to look at what we think about this way of uh, engagement of people as a community work and then see if it's really effective or not if, if it's effective what are the what are the lessons and we can see this from the african side that it's quite common to work on trophy hunting in asia it's just nothing we are running we we have this idea but and uh, it's it's a difficult situation nowadays in the world because uh, for example in africa we are discussing about the trophy hunting i mean not we the, the the people are discussing about the trophy hunting but it's mostly the american and british people which are uh, and groups and animal rights groups which are opposing the idea of trophy hunting which has caused lots of problems for countries in in like botswana like south africa which are which leave which needs those, those money so we need to think that well this is an idea which has been worked somehow we, we are we have also areas in iran that have been able to recover the urial and bizarre goat using the trophy hunting from just a, a few dozen to to one to a few to several hundreds so we need to show the evidence and the evidence means that we need to study them and students that that's that's a great opportunity for the students to be engaged because it's also about the ecology, it's about the biology, and also at the same time, it's working with people, communities. So it, it gives them lots of opportunities to learn too many skills at the same time. So, and at the same time, good, having a good publication at the end. So that's one way, I, but, uh, but the other one, like the ecotourism and the, the strict conservation, they are also important speech, which needs to be considered as well. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Thank yeah, you. No worries. So, yes, Dr. Sir. Dr. Fradinia, what do you suggest that uh, in land sharing and land sparing model, did we, did we use both of them combinedly? Because one, uh, one species used the land sharing model and other used land, mm -hmm. land sparing models. So, so what about a combination of both of these models? So in, in the reality and the real world, what is important is that just to expand the national parks and protected areas, I think Pakistan is about 13% and Iran is about 11.5. So basically Iran and Pakistan are the top countries in, the, in West Asia in terms of having the maximum amount of land that's protected. The other countries are much less. So that's a problem. But anyway, we already are about 11 or 13%. So that's the first priority to expand it, to expand as much as we can. But we know that the governments are not able to do that rapidly and effectively because it's not important to put an area as a national park. It's important to make sure that the rangers, they have motorbikes and fuel and payment and salaries and you know and insurance, everything is in, in place, which is not easy, especially nowadays with the COVID, which the economy is not doing well. So we need to be realistic. And in that way, what is important is just to supplement what we think as national park and protected areas by having more areas but, but those areas can be community-based areas, community-managed areas. It can be by the, either for ecotourism, for, for trophy hunting, for, for everything. But at the same time that we are giving people some sort of ownership and governance to those areas, but we know that these community-based areas are not 100% uh, effective against you know, development and roads and mine, mine activities and everything but they are pro prepared, providing some level of protection. So in that way, we have people, and at the same time, we have the coexisting people with 
wildlife like large carnivores. So we have the national parks and the protected areas with much less people, the spared lands, and at the same time around them having the, the shared land with people. So what is important in this paradigm is that we as biologists and conservationists, and I can see this in, in, is happening in Iran too much, and I presume it should be the same in Pakistan. We think that the only way to protect the nature is to have the national park. It's great to have the national park. It's great to have too many protected areas, but it's not the only way. We need to cope with the growing number of people. Iran and Pakistan have the largest population, human population in, the, in, in West Asia. So we need, they need food, they need water, they need land, leaf. So we need to cope with the realities. And the realities is that, well, as much as we can, we need to spare land as a national park and protected areas. Then don't be disappointed. Don't be fri frightened that it's, it's just 11% or 13% of the entire country. We need to add more land in terms of having more, but with people more engaged, with people as community-based areas like trophy hunting, ecotourism, or everything. So that's just a, a positive way of, uh, uh, of thinking about what we can cope with the increasing number of human and at the same time, uh, saving the population of the wildlife. Yes, thank you so much. We have community-based organizations in Pakistan where the 70% revenue goes to the community and 30% to the government. And to give an uh, overview, a single trophy of uh, Suleiman Marfur cost around $100,000 to the yeah. national hunters. So around uh, in those $100,000, $70,000 goes to community and the $30,000 goes to the government. So what about the current scenario at the borderline areas of Pakistan and Iran due to the construction of boundary line or those areas? It is not going to hinder the, migra the migration or the transmission of uh, wildlife from inter uh, transnational movement of wildlife animals. Like we have quite a large number of healthy habitat in, on the Pakistan's uh, Iran, Iranian border. And sometimes the animals move around between the countries, but due to the construction of all those barricades and wires, is it not possible to have some kind of corridor construction on those border areas? Yeah, that's, 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 a, that's a really good question. So we have this growing interest in the government and the presidents and you know, administration that they want to build the wall. And when you could see that the wall was one of the big promises for President Trump four years ago to get the votes from, you know, in, in the United States. And then he put lots of money. So, and we are thinking, well, if the US wants to do that, obviously our governments would do that the same because somehow they are looking around to see what the West is doing in, in, in this security thing. I think that was a, a very bad thing for our environment and, and, and wildlife. So nowadays we can see this growing interest in our region, like, China, like uh, uh, Turkey. Turkey has put lots of fences and, and Turkmenistan. And uh, I don't know how is the situation, I guess, between Euro India and Pakistan as well. So there are many countries that they, are, they want to put, uh, they make sure that the land is protected. And, you know, somehow when we think about the governments and countries, if we have land dispute between two countries, it's very difficult to, to promote conservation because the land dispute is perhaps one of the first thing you need to resolve before thinking about conservation. Because the question is, okay, we want to protect this land. Whose land is this? Is this for us or is this for you? And then it means that we need to mark the borders. Uh, this, is how, this is not our thinking, this is how the governments are thinking. So, and we have lots of land dispute in, in Asia. That's, that's one of the problems. We don't have that land, that much land dispute in, in Europe. But in Asia, we have too much. And you, can, you could see the Armenia-Azerbaijan conflict um, a few months ago, and which many people were just you know, killed. And many of we had this issue with, with Iraq as well for, for, for a number of years. So we need to deal with this situation. Uh, it's what we can think, think about how to deal with these borders and these walls and fences is that we need to engage with these policymakers. So the, I mean, it's, it's, there is no straightforward answer to do that because it's not us who make the decision. It's, it's not us who pay the, for the walls and buy and walls. It's for it's the government, big, 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 you know, big corporation, big, big names there. So what, what I, we think is that is we need to engage with them. We need to work with them. Well, these are the animals that are moving across the border. For example, for many ungulates, if there is a border, one country would, may, may lose the whole population. For larger carnivores, it's much easier because they can climb, but it's, again, it's, it's, it's important to make sure. Uh, 
And at the same, maybe we can see that, well, this is a critical time moment for in the lives of migration, for example, that these weeks are important. So for that, a couple of weeks, just open the border in, the, in this point, tiny area, just to make sure that the animals are just passing. And at the same time, if the animals are moving across the border in search of resources, well, if the wall is there, we need to make sure that resources are provided on the other side of the border. So if it's for the water, we need to make sure that the water is on, on both sides, so they are not obliged to, to move. But it's very difficult. It's, we need to, and it's very context dependent on the government as well, but we need to engage with them just to, from the beginning. There is a question uh, that can you please guide something about GPS tracking and radio tracking of the animals? Yeah, sure. So, you know what? One of the main things for the animals is that they move. And to understand the movement, we need to color, put a color or tag. So, these tags and colors, they work in a number of ways. So, one way is to put uh, the color is equipped with the GPS, and the GPS is sent to the satellite. And I think in, 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 uh, in West Asia, the first country who deployed this technology was Pakistan. And it was about 10, 15 years ago or so that was deployed on a small leopard in, in somewhere in, in Pakistan. So that was, so this technology sending the GPS uh, data through the satellite and through the satellite to your cell phone. So each unit, it depends on the, on the, on the, uh, uh, the company, but we paid about $25,000 for six colors. So it's not cheap. It's an expensive technology, but it's very efficient because without this technology, we simply cannot understand all these things that I described to you. And then we have much cheaper technology, which is the VHF color. So to, for the VHF color, you don't have get the GPS, but you need to follow the animal every day on a, with the an antenna, trying to find it and then trying to find estimate the exact location of the animal on your map. So it's an old fashioned technology. Now, nobody nowadays use that one, but it's very cheap. It can be about a single unit can be bought with a few hundred dollars, but it's very, I mean, it's uh, the efficiency is not really great. So yeah, and with these borders, it's, it's uh, I think the best way to understand how these borders are working back to the last question. I think this GPS technology is important because they show us where are exactly those locations which are crucial for the borders. But at the same time, we know that the governments are much sometimes unhappy about this technology because they would be, well, what is inside those colors? Is it safe or is it not safe? Or what type of data they are collecting? So sometimes they're not happy, by the way. So some ecologists were against the use of drones in serving the wildlife populations. What do you say about that? Drones are nowadays used increasingly. So they can be, so drones are basically, they can be used for a number of reasons. One, one is to understand the, the, the vegetation maps because they are taking photos from much lower elevations. So the, 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 uh, nowadays we use mostly use NDVI maps on GIS, but these low, uh, low elevation photos can be very good for to map the vegetation. Uh, but if we can use them to identify the, the species, for example, for the gazelles, for, I mean, for it's what it can be used sometimes for the birds, for seashore birds, just photos and then count them from the, from the air, uh, for ungulates as well, for like the gazelles, perhaps. Uh, uh, I, I can, I saw people uh, like uh, Mr. Nabian that you know, you know him, he used drones for, to count the Persian follow deer. In, in an island in northwestern Iran near Turkey border. But it's a close population, but it's a mountainous landscape. So he tried to use the drone to find them in this landscape, which was very good. But I have not seen anything, anyone use them for the carnivores because carnivores, don't, they don't show up, they just disappear. It's much uh, difficult. Can I come in please now? Yes, sure, sir. Thank you so much. Uh... Uh, Bilal Mustafa for giving the opportunity. Let me uh, thank uh, Dr. Uh, Farhadinia uh, for a very informative and nice presentation. It was really illuminating. Thank you so much, Doctor. Uh, my name is Babur Khan. I am uh, currently associated with the uh, EC Mode. EC Mode stands for uh, the International Center for Integrated Conservation of uh, Cons Integrated Conservation and Mountain Development. 
We are based in Kathmandu. We work in uh, eight regional countries of the Hindu Kush uh, Himalayan mountain range. Uh, your presentation was indeed uh, very interesting for me because I'm a wildlife ecologist and, and have been working for WWF for almost 18 years. Uh, one of the biggest challenges in wildlife conservation nowadays is the human wildlife conflict. Yes. Uh, you probably know uh, that the conflict uh, has become, you know, uh, frequent and intensified with the passage of every, every passing day. Earlier, carnivores were attacking on livestock, but now the attacks have, uh, you know, reached to humans as well, you know. Just a couple of years ago in Delhi region of Pakistan, we witnessed a common leopard attacks on women. Some, some of them were killed and some were seriously injured. A same pattern of, you know, leopard attacks particularly, I will not uh, include the snow leopard in this list, but the larger and leopards, particularly the common leopard, uh, has been continuously attacking on humans in this region. And this has become a chronic issue for many of the conservationists and protected area managers. I partly agree with uh, your model of, you know, merging, uh, going for a combination of uh, both coexistence models and uh, uh, the protected area model, you know. Uh, it looks quite, uh, quite attractive uh, to listen about and to see it, but how it can be implemented practically on the ground. I couldn't understand it, one thing. Yeah. Secondly, during the last one decade, the protected area network coverage in the Hindu Kushima land range has increased by almost 22%. As you already know that uh, the cost of conservation has been built uh, by the herders living in those yeah. highly remote rugged mountain areas uh, where economic opportunities are already uh, you know, negligible. Yeah. They are poor people, they are marginal disadvantaged and highly dependent on the ecosystem services. Wildlife is one of that. Uh, so don't you think further, you know, expanding the protected area network uh, will, you know, put a lot of restrictions for the herders whose primary source of livelihood is livestock actually grazing in that area. And this expansion of almost 22% all has already restricted their access to the most productive uh, grasslands in the mountains. Yeah. We know land being very limited uh, they ultimately have to depend on rangelands and pastures to graze their animals. If we further expand the protected area, that will certainly, you know, uh, affect their life and livelihoods. So could you please uh, share your thoughts on this? How you have proposed model of, of the merger of two different approaches can really help mitigate the human wildlife conflict and benefit yeah. the herders who are dependent on these areas for the lab. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Yeah, two very insightful questions. So what uh, uh, I think we discussed about it, about how these two models can work. What, what is important is that we are thinking about, I mean, the, our governments are expanding the commitment to make sure that 30% of the land is protected by 2015. And this commitment would be signed in the next few months in China. And all the governments which are a, part, a, a member of the CBD, this is the Convention of Biodiversity, would sign it. So the question is, is that really possible to put 30% of the land protected as national park or protected area by the next 10 years? The answer is simply for our systems like Iran, for Pakistan, for many of these regions, is, 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 is very unlikely. It's, it's very unlikely to do that. So it seems that it's like a commitment from uh, regions or governments which are able, and but it's not really possible for many countries like us, which are dependent really on natural resources, as you mentioned. So what we can think about, and that is mostly about the land sparing. So spare the land, 
up to 30% for protection. But there is a consequence to do that, as you mentioned, which is, well, we put the pressure and restriction to people which are dependent on those lands. And in that national park, which, we, uh, which I worked and in Tandura National Park, when in 1970, they established a national park, they just evacuated the national park from the people it was during Shah and during the revolution. And then evacuated the national park and the people which were dependent on the national park pastures, they were just left without any pasture. And now we can see the largest, num the largest number of poachers exactly from those villages which left without any pasture. They lost, they lost their lives as you, well, we can't expand the national parks too much. That's exactly my feeling too. So that is exactly what we need to think about. Well, we need to somehow manage the land in a way that people have their own pastures and rights and accessibilities, but at the same time, making sure that the wildlife are also living there. Obviously, we know that if we have people and wildlife at the same time, people and wildlife, there would be some conflict, there would be some clashes. So I, I removed uh, a few slides from this talk for, 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 because I thought that it could be too long, but I, I need to just uh, have a, uh, give you a brief uh, discussion about that one. So when we colored those six leopards, we found that all of them are going among people. So basically all of them are going from the spared land, the national park to people's land. And we thought, well, why all of them are going to kill people or dogs or sheep. But eventually it was only one leopard, only one individual out of the six, which was killing mainly the sheep and dogs. He killed 15 dogs in a few months, plus five sheep and goats. So the rest were going among people, but they didn't kill anything. But the, the, the one that individual, that single leopard, it was, it, it was a dog killer. And then when you compare these animals with each other, you could see that that, that, that one was a problem animal. And this is the, a notion that we need to consider in the management of these conflict issues. Many times we are, proper, we, we are discussing about the whole population of the leopards or the bull, the small leopard, or whatever, or tiger, or whatever. But it's eventually one or two individuals which are causing the main damages. They can be a, an animal with a broken canine, it can, it can be a, an old. So in this situation, we need to intervene because people are also living there. We, can't, a, a, we can let people to lose an animal every day. We can, lose the, we can allow people to live with fear and this, you know, the cost of living with the kids playing around and, the, and this dog killer is around. We need to capture them. We need to make sure that all those problem individuals are not causing a problem to the whole population. Because if we don't do anything with those problem individuals, they would cause a fear and anger to people and people would, could, would go out and put poison for, and, and then we can lose five leopards or six leopards or the entire population because they cause animosity between the population of leopards and humans. So managing these individual in, uh, animals is important. And that was something that I was not aware of before putting the colors on the leopards. Because whenever a leopard was among people, we thought that, well, this is a, a hungry animal going to, keep, to kill a sheep or dog. That was not like that. These animals patrol many times among people. They just see to see what's, what's going on. But at the same time, it was just one single individual. And that was exactly for the brown bears in Wyoming in North America. They put colors on, I think, 17 brown bears, grizzly bears. And then we found, they found that it's, it's about two adult males which are causing 90% of the attacks to the cattle. So if they had removed those two cattle, those uh, two males, they were uh, much less you know, peace for people and the grizzly bears. So that's one of the consequences of thinking about coexistence. Coexistence does not mean to leave the animals to live on the people's land without any intervention because people need to make sure that they are, their land is also, and their lives are also protected. And that's our job, that's, our, that's up to us, that we need to be trained, that we need to be intervening, that when we need to intervene, we need to need to do something for those animals. So that's another aspect of this, land sharing aspect, we need to sometimes intervene. And this intervention is sometimes uh, bloody. 
that can be sometimes dangerous because taking animal transplication to somewhere else, or sometimes you need to put it in a zoo. And then can raise a huge problem because animal rights groups would go out and say, well, why you are capturing a wild animal and put it in a zoo? Because you want to make money, because you want to, and we would be accused of every, everything. So we have a bloody difficult way ahead because we need to, we need to deal with many things. But I think that's the only way we can think about it if the future. Making sure that the national parks are safe, are properly invested, expand them if it's possible. If it's not, just to think about other models. To think about, well, the people are there. What somehow trying to think about the snow leopards and bears and leopards and wolves are also there. Sorry, it's going to be too long, but yeah, hopefully I captured the yeah, whole thank the, you. The, 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 the question. Thank you. The, key, the key message, I think, is that we need to uh, take care of the conservation needs uh, of biodiversity while managing it uh, in an integrated manner with the livelihoods and development needs of the local people. Because Definitely, unless that's we take care thing. of the people, we will not be able to conserve our fish. Definitely. Yeah. Thank yeah. you, Professor. Thank you so yeah, much. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, sir, I have a question. Yeah, please go ahead. Is there any captive breeding program has started in Iran regarding leopards? So uh, that, that's a good question. Uh, to be honest, I think Iran does not need a breeding program for the leopards because when you need a breeding program that you have empty habitats, that when you want to re that later you can release them and Iran currently does not have habit. I mean, many habitats are still connected so leopards could easily recolonize. Re re or when you think that it's just tiny numbers out there so you need to do something and captive breeding is almost one of them. So you, you think that if I don't captive breed, uh, they would go out and they would and they were gone forever. The leopards in Iran are not in that situation currently. They are still abundant. They are, seems to be stable in many parts. And at the same time, uh, the habitats are still occupied most of the time by the leopards. But there are about six, seven leopards in, in, in the zoos. And uh, amazingly, these zoos are not happy to collaborate with each other. It's interesting. Each one has its own mate or female, so they are not happy to share or mate so it's another business thing between these zoos they don't want to share these animals with each other but yeah there is no planned capture breeding for, for the leopards in Iran. thank you so much sir thank you so much dr fradinia for accepting thank our you, invitation and giving us such a wonderful talk we would hope to work with you in future and welcome to inshallah. pakistan whenever you want inshallah thank you so much all the participants for coming to the meeting. Okay. Have a nice evening and afternoon for everyone. Have a nice day. Thank you.